Welcome back. We've had a lot of questions regarding vocal mixing, so let's just do it. Two hard pills to swallow. The things I'm showing you are general guidelines, and they don't necessarily apply to every vocal you use. The difference between a good audio engineer and somebody who's just simply following the rules is the ability to use your ears to judge whether or not you should follow the traditional guidelines. And the hardest thing to hear is if your vocal is bad when you start, you cannot fix it in post. If you are starting with something that does not sound good, it will still not sound good. Now this applies to the quality of the recording, i.e. room reverb, does your room sound nice? And it also applies to the performance itself. If your vocal is out of tune and dynamically all over the place, it's very hard to fix that in a believable manner in post. This is why in my other videos, I have constantly emphasized the fact that you should be using a dynamic microphone if you do not have a treated room. That way you don't hear the ugly reflections nearly as much. I have an untreated room. I'm using a 57 really close to my face. That way I don't get as much audio signal from the highly reflective environment around me. Know when to use these rules, use your ear as a judge, and know that you're gonna need a good signal coming in in order to make a good signal in the edit. For everyone, voiceover, streaming, YouTube videos, singing, you're gonna need EQ and you're gonna need compression. Musicians specifically, you're going to need EQ, compression, probably a de -er or siblings control, and you're gonna need return or auxiliary tracks. These are the most basic components of vocal treatment. There are more advanced techniques like parallel compression, side chain compression, dynamic EQs, and a bunch of other things. Here we have a very basic vocal chain that we're gonna go through, starting with the EQ. Now humans hear between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz in general. Now what an EQ is, is a graphic representation of that range of human hearing. If you look at most graphic EQs, the very far left is 20 hertz. The very far right is 20,000 hertz. First thing I want you to do is listen to our untreated vocal that comes from my video, the NT1 versus the SM7B. We're using the same vocalist, Carolina Alabao. Una vez un sabio me dijo que cuando uno vuela alto hay peligro de poderse quemar. So if you look at the EQ8, and I probably edited it so you could only look at the EQ8, we're seeing our main spike in the vocal around the 500 hertz range. That is what we call the fundamental frequency. I'm not going to get too far into the harmonics and fundamental frequencies and all that stuff, uh, but I do want to show you. So I've muted the vocal. I want you to see how we have a main spike where her fundamental harmonics are, her fundamental frequencies. And then we have a bunch of smaller spikes following it. These are the harmonics that are actually characterizing the tonality of her voice. That's definitely stuff we want to preserve whenever we mix these vocals. Now below the main spike, we have essentially mud. That's not anything we want to hear in the vocal itself. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the one, set it to a low cut. I'm going to play the vocal and then I'm just going to move the low cut further and further until I feel I've cut out most of the mud from the mix itself. Keep in mind, you don't want to cut too much that you're actually cannibalizing the fundamental frequency in the singer's voice. That's a big no-no. So once you've cut out the low-end mud from your singer, and it's going to vary depending on the singer's vocal range, next thing to do is what I call the magnifying glass. Basically take one of the other moving parts of your EQ, turn the Q up so it's a giant spike, and boost that signal to the max. We're going to find ugly harmonics where the room itself or some other part of the environment made some noticeable mud. Now that you've gone through your vocal and kind of with a magnifying glass searched out where these harsh signals are, that's the more clinical part of your EQ. I personally like to add an EQ for flavor a little bit later. Next thing we're going to do though is compression. Now I've made a video completely about compression. If you want to watch that, 
It's a much more in-depth video about what I'm going to go through here. But we are, are going to talk about threshold and ratio specifically in this video. I'm not going to touch on attack and release as much, but if you'd like to see it, as well as much more about compression, go check that video out. So if we listen to the vocal, I'm just going to figure out where her vocal is peaking at around the loudest part of her singing level. So she's peaking around negative 20. That's about where her top of the line vocal is. So I'm going to set our ratio to two and a half to one, basically meaning for every two and a half decibels that we're compressing, we're getting one decibel out. Then I'm gonna set our ratio so that bend happens around negative 20. So the peaks of her vocal are going to be squashed and more similar to the volume level for where she's a little bit quieter. Now, if you notice, whenever I play it, and I turn the compressor off. Si la vida te sonríe, porque miras a otro lado. It's a lot quieter because we've literally taken the peaks, the loudest part of her vocal, and made it quieter. What we're going to need to do then is take that makeup gain, push it up farther. So therefore, we're back to around the negative 20 dB level even when it's compressed. Si la vida te sonríe. This is going to bring out the breath in her vocal, and it's also going to make it a little bit smoother. One thing you're also going to notice is the quieter parts of her vocal and the quieter sections of the song are going to be louder. We've equalized the voice so that whenever we're speaking quietly and whenever we're singing loudly, they're similar in volume or they're closer together. This is a way to, in post-production, make your voice louder. It's not necessarily just cranking up the gain until you've filled your entire audio signal with a bunch of room noise. You can take a compressor afterwards and make the quieter parts of your vocal louder and the louder parts of your vocal quieter or compressing it. Next, I call the creative EQ section. Basically, I'm gonna go take the exact same EQ that I used before, and this time, I'm gonna use it to emphasize the parts of her voice that I think are nice. For example, Carolina has a, a relatively high voice, so I'm gonna add a shelf to the higher frequencies of her vocal range. That way, her high vocals are emphasized by the EQ. <laughs> Now, I don't necessarily want a lot of these high frequencies here, so I'm going to add a high cut in the super high end range because I think it just adds a little bit too much. And I might add a little bit of a boost around this area here, because I see a lot of her fundamental frequencies are occurring in that range. Great. If you're just doing voiceover or streaming, this is probably where I would stop. But if you're in music, I would add one more component. So friends, that's where we're going to stop for today. Because according to my YouTube data, people aren't going to stick around for a 16 minute video from me just yet. I'll go ahead and spoil the surprise within the coming few days. We're going to go over sibilance control and auxiliary and return tracks. That way we can add some reverb delays and other effects to our vocals. But for now, we're going to stop here. If you're a voiceover artist, this is basically all you need to know, except for maybe DSing. Anyways, I will see you next time. Goodbye.